and have it available internally inside the Cohen Veterans Network on our internet and also externally on our YouTube channel because the idea is this is something we've made available to the general public today and we're very um, excited about that. A reminder that everyone will stay on mute for the majority of the hour today, but feel free. You can go ahead and ask questions in the chat throughout and I think we'll have some time at the end. I'll be able to read those off and we can get questions answered um, uh, towards the end of the hour. Um, so to get us started, I can tell you that, you know, for sure, the ways that families can communicate around gun violence as they prepare for the back to school transition is of personal and, pro and professional interest to all of us. And we are very happy to have Dr. Melissa Brimer with us here today. And you could read Dr. Brimer's um, credentials on screen. I'll tell you just to drop more. Um, she's been involved with the development of acute interventions, assessment and educational materials in the area of terrorism, disasters, mass violence, public health emergencies, and school crisis. Um, so Dr. Brimer, thank you very much for joining us today, and we're happy we can share this again inside our network and outside with the public as well. Um, so take it away, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, ask questions uh, at the end of you. Absolutely, and feel free to use the chat to have discussions amongst each other. Um, I think uh, this this topic brings out a lot of thoughts and feelings, and so feel free to even just have a, have a dialogue on the on the chat with each other. So thanks for uh, this honor of being with you today. Um, just a, a little bit more about me. I'm at actually the UCLA side. I'm a full a professional researcher, but I'm also the director of terrorism and disaster programs at the UCLA Duke University National Center for Child Traumatic Stress. If you haven't heard about our network, we are funded by SAMHSA, and our mission is to raise the standard of care and to improve access for all kids who have been impacted by any type of trauma um, and also to support their, their families. So currently, we have 164 centers funded across the uh, country, and we have uh, centers in Guam and in Puerto Rico. And we do actually um, also specialize in helping military and veteran families in helping with some of the additional traumas that, um, that these families are experienced too. So if you have not seen our military and veterans uh, resources, I'll show you how to get to our website in just a little bit. But today's conversation is, um, is about mass violence. There's been a lot of uh, incidences uh, recently and in the news, uh, some uh, school shootings. And it's been a topic amongst many parents and caregivers, um, educators, and even mental health providers. But um, what's interesting is there's actually no true universal definition for mass violence. So when we try to find out what has been uh, the prevalence of these events, uh, some, uh, depending on the website, they will use uh, different definitions. Some definitions focus on the method of how the crime was committed, such as uh, when guns are used, um, some will focus on the motive of the or the perceived motive of the perpetrator. So uh, then at those times, we'll be hearing about hate crimes or terrorism. And that many times, um, depending on uh, who did the attack and again, the motive, uh, many times interpersonal violence or gang deaths are not counted in mass violence uh, numbers. Um, and some groups like the Victims of Crime um, will look at eligibility uh, requirements of who should get federal assistance. So it's important when you're looking at the numbers, how they're doing that definition. But one thing that we can all agree on is just the far impact that these mass violence events have in um, the community that's been impacted, the region, and actually uh, throughout the US and many times globally. Um, I do respond to many school shootings and mass violent events, but we know that when kids are involved, um, there's a much more emotional toll um, on our society. 
So I was the uh, project uh, in, uh, program um, principal investigator of an NIJ, National Institute of Justice grant, where we examined uh, 10 mass uh, violence events and school shootings. And you're going to see uh, some quotes from some of the uh, qualitative interviews that we did. We interviewed over 200 uh, individuals. Some were their uh, bereaved family members. Some were in the incidences, first responders, media, coroners, you name it. Uh, we all interviewed. And so you're going to see some snapshots of some of the uh, content of these um, of what they said to us. Um, I do know that sometimes it's hard to, to read some of these quotes, but it's important for us to heal, hear directly from those impacted by these events. And so you see here one leader when she was finding out um, about an incident um, was saying, I said I needed to know what happened. He said, yeah, I know. He says, it's really bad. And he was struggling. He said, it could be 30. I said, you're kidding. 30 means to me, I knew it was more than adults. It was kids. And there was something especially different and heartbreaking, knowing that those missing kids were dead. So I'm thinking now, oh my God, my God, 30 kids. Others talked about when a, an incident that includes um, many deaths, that then um, going to all the funerals just changes everyone in the community. They think about the young lives that were murdered in that school shoot, uh, setting and how they were um, at the beginning of their life and in their career uh, and just how, how much this takes a toll. So when we think about and provide behavioral health support to a community that's had a, a school shooting or mass violent event, we need to not just think about individual interventions, but actually helping the entire community out because their differential impacts are such, such widespread. And I, when I'm thinking about responding to these events, um, we don't, there's not a, a cookie cutter approach, meaning we do have to take some factors into consideration of how we respond to these events. Things that I consider is first and foremost, learn about the community. Have they had a previous uh, trauma or a previous uh, gun violence or mass violence event? Was there something coming up that the community or the school was looking forward to? Were there recent uh, changes that have uh, impacted uh, the scenario? Sometimes the holidays uh, can make a difference. Many of you know that Sandy Hook was right before the um, Christmas uh, holidays, and that was a very difficult time for the community. Parkland was on Valentine's Day and really kind of changed um, that holiday for that community. We also think about um, what are some of the distinguishing features of that event, the magnitude of it. Sandy Hook being an elementary school because of so many young lives that were, were killed on that day really had a profound impact for many parents across the country. Um, how many people were exposed to, um, to the incident? Were there um, different groups impacted? We're seeing many of our recent uh, mass violent events being targeted against certain identities, whether it's our LGBTQ communities, um, uh, Buffalo, which was a direct target against our, um, our Black communities, um, our Asian communities, thinking about um, are there certain identities and groups that are really struggling with some of those safety factors? And how do we think about and integrate cultural rituals and traditions Although I was the lead advisor to Sandy Hook and helped the Newtown Public Schools uh, uh, create their recovery program, it's been very important to talk to Uvalde that what was done in Newtown can't um, happen in Uvalde exactly the same way. We need to appreciate the, uh, the Hispanic traditions and rituals, thinking about some of those community um, traditions that need to be integrated in. Um, 
we've been working, for example, in Uvalde with some of the faith-based uh, groups that really have a, a profound um, influence in, with some of the families in supporting them. So really thinking about how we need to adapt, um, and you'll hear me talk about that throughout. So as we think about kind of um, when we're talking about how do we support anyone who's been through mass violence, uh, or a school shooting or gun violence, there's a few kind of concepts that I would like to all of us to keep in mind. Um, we sometimes hear in the, in the media that everyone is traumatized by, um, by an event. I want to take us back because we tend to um, know that many people will recover after these events, but there are certain factors that might put some individuals more at risk. So we know, for example, those that had the most direct exposure are gonna have more difficulty with their intensity of reactions and also with um, resolving any um, symptomatology that they might be having. So anyone that was in life threat, who was injured, um, who provided first aid, we know that individuals whose loved ones were killed or injured, first responders, we're hearing and seeing lots of data now how our first responders, although they're trained to respond to these events, they too are, um, are impacted by these events. And many first responders usually tend to live in the community where these events occur and they know the individuals, they know the kids who have been tragically killed in these situations. We learned in our work with Virginia Tech that especially um, college students and, um, and uh, kids, when they have prolonged worry about the safety of others, we know that that actually um, was correlated with higher rates of PTSD. Um, we also need to know that when something happens and it's all over the news, I always check in with those that I know who have experienced a previous trauma. So with Uvalde, when that happened, we were reaching out to our Sandy Hook colleagues, to our Parkland in Chardon to check to see how they were doing. For those that you serve um, who might've had a recent death, um, whether it's because of um, being an active duty uh, because of COVID, we know that um, those who have recently experienced a death might be um, really resonating with what's happening now and might be seeing a, a, resurg a resurgence of some of their reactions. We're also finding that um, individuals with histories of physical or sexual assaults who also experienced a mass violence, they are more likely to have PTSD and depression one year um, post the event. Um, and the other piece that we're truly seeing these days is the, that those with limited social supports are having more difficulty um, healing and tend to have um, higher rates of PTSD than those who have social supports. And so that really does tap into, if we're wanting to um, make sure that we support people and help to mitigate some of the long-term impacts of these events, how do we really make sure that those that were most impacted have those support tools to help them? We also know that mass violent events can have other secondary adversities. There can be other um, threats that occur in that community or in that region. We know for some families, they might have financial impacts. They might have to move um, at home. So when I'm working with individuals, I wanna understand what other secondary impacts are going on so that we can make sure that we provide that, that level of support. Um, many times um, when I hear presentations about mass violence or school shootings, there's a real emphasis on the trauma piece. But I'm going to want us to make sure that we also talk about bereavement and grief. Mass violence in and of itself means that there typically is a death of a love, uh, death of somebody. And what we're seeing is that the pathway for trauma and the pathway for grief isn't the same. 
So we might um, talk about that we have treatments for trauma and that people can resolve their trauma. With grief, um, we don't resolve missing that loved one who has been um, so important in our lives. We make meaning, we learn how to adjust, but over time, every time there's that anniversary, we're always going to be thinking about that person that's not with us anymore. Where in, over time, the trauma, once we start to work on those trauma symptoms, those that didn't have the grief, they might not be as affected over the anniversaries as much as those who are bereaved. We also want, I also want you to think about that when we're talking about reactions, one of the critical pieces that we think is so important to educate quite early is thinking about the role of trauma and loss reminders. So a trauma reminder is something that makes us think about that day. It actually puts us in um, that fear again that worry about our safety, feeling in danger. Many times um, heart rates go up. So with Uvalde, we really spent a lot of time actually talking about um, that 4th of July could have been a potential trauma reminder for those um, kids and staff who were in uh, Rob Elementary School that day. The fireworks, the sounds, being in crowds, um, not knowing, um, uh, safety areas could really be a trigger. So we spent, we actually created a resource for that. Um, it could be uh, after one high school I, uh, where there was a school shooting, kids talked to me about not wanting to go to an amusement park anymore. And I first thought it was because of screams when you're on one of the rides, but they also told me that um, being in the most popular rides, there usually are long lines that uh, if you're in the middle of that um, line, you almost feel trapped. There's nowhere to escape. And that's how they felt um, during that, that shooting. And so sometimes a trauma reminder can be a sensation or a feeling. It could be the time of day, when it happened, um, what I even was wearing. Uh, and so it's important for us to identify what these trauma reminders are because those trauma reminders make us feel like we are unsafe, many times make us feel out of control. And what we want to do is help those that we're working with that they do have the ability to identify these reminders, help themselves to actually cope with them when they do happen. So many times early on, we identify those trauma reminders. We help them to discriminate that they're not in that um, unsafe situation right now? And what's those tools that they can utilize to help to calm their bodies down? Do they need a support of another adult? Do they need to distract themselves? Do they need to do some mindfulness? All are kind of critical um, avenues to help um, to make sure that those that are impacted by a mass violence, we think about tools that they can utilize to help them with their trauma. Loss reminders are those reminders that make us think about that loved one that is no longer with us. It could be the holidays that, they're, um, that they used to have an uh, a, a, a important role um, in that doing um, the holiday meal. It could be um, a song that I heard in helping again, when they identify these reminders, thinking about how we can honor those loved ones, thinking about what kind of supports they need um, so that they can deal with both the trauma aspects and the loss aspects. We also know that there's so many different psychological reactions and it's not just PTSD that those who have experienced a mass violence event can experience. One of the most Prominent reactions I hear about and is actually one of the longest la uh, lasting are sleep issues. Many talk to me about having difficulty falling asleep, waking up often. Uh, they might express additional uh, nightmares. 
Some will talk about uh, significant overwhelming sadness or grief, um, withdrawal from uh, those social supports that uh, are meaningful from them just because they can't handle uh, those kind of interactions. We know for some kids, there might be academic uh, impacts or irritability or anger issues. So it's important that we identify those psychological reactions that uh, individuals might be having and also the developmental consequences that might happen. So many of those that I, I've worked with um, youth have talked to me. Um, I wanted to go into the military, but after my experience, I didn't know if I could be around gunshots any, any longer. Um, they sometimes have wanted to go into the mental health field because they want to help others. Uh, some have um, had impaired relationships um, because they having a difficulty navigating or communicating when they're really struggling. So it's important for us to acknowledge and identify what are some of the developmental consequences that uh, those who have been impacted by mass violence um, are facing and making sure that our interventions are supporting that. But mass violence events also taps into those adults um, that are on the phone with, um, um, on this uh, po uh, webinar with me. And we particularly have this um, belief system that we can protect our kids and that schools are a safe place. And when these events happen, especially at schools, that protective shield is violated and really can. Um, uh, may, uh, bring out a profound impact of guilt and shame that somehow we didn't do what was necessary. And sometimes we have to make sure that we support those feelings, as well as when um, the social contract is violated. So what I'm talking about is the social contract is that there are institutions that are there to support us that are um, there to help um, make amends for what happened. And when those institutions fail us um, or don't actually um, uh, protect us, whether it's the criminal system, our law enforcement um, policies, um, um, governmental policies, those can also impact us. And that does include um, when some of our those that we worked with talked about being discriminated against or experiencing racism when they've also experienced this mass violent event. So we need to make sure that we keep these concepts in mind and um, identify them and support them when we're doing kind of interventions. But I told you that it's really important for us not to just focus on the grief piece but also on, excuse me, the trauma piece, but also focus on grief. And I just feel like this quote really helps to convey that um, why acknowledging bereavement and grief is so important. There is perhaps no other human experience that is as deeply private while being so openly public as being bereft from the death of a loved one. The course of grief reactions is embedded in our cultural envelope of mourning rituals and support that is further positioned under an umbrella of social recognition of the status of being bereaved. So we do really want to make sure that um, those, if we're working with those who have experienced um, a death due to gun violence or um, um, uh, mass violence, that we need to sp give special attention to the bereaved. Because one thing I am finding in my research is that the bereaved are telling us that many mental health providers and those in the community are avoidant in talking to the bereaved about what their experiences were. So many of them said that no one talked to me about my loved one dying. People avoided me because they were afraid to, um, of saying the wrong things. So instead of getting more supports, I got less supports. So this one uh, bereaved parent 
um, had this, gave me this quote and said to me, um, it's not being asked uh, and not being uh, afraid to ask. I think when it comes to grief and loss, people are afraid to go there and ask. I think it honors the family and it honors them more when you do acknowledge and ask and try to work with them on um, in terms of how to keep them connected, whether it's to the school district or uh, community, it's uncomfortable, it's hard. It's hard for people to go there. There's uncertainty of um, how much emotionality we're gonna handle, but it's more upsetting when we don't and we need to go there. Um, and we need to make sure that we support the bereaved. We also have to appreciate that those who experienced a mass violence event do not get the luxury of grieving privately. They have to, um, many know their names, they know their situations. Um, and sometimes that also means that we have to help to protect them from negative media or just being bombarded by too many asks for help. Um, I've also learned by doing this work that just because they we put them in a group of being bereaved, that doesn't mean they share the same perspective or want the same things. And that we really do have to ask them their perspectives, their needs and their wants and not make assumptions because I've worked with another bereaved family. Um, many will reassess their social networks because they've been hurt or um, feel like mistrust of how um, certain people in their network have handled that situation. And so they'll, we'll need to think about, is there others that we can add that can help them um, navigate and get those supports? And sometimes that may mean um, helping them connect with other families who have experienced other mass violence so that there's that support and that hope uh, within that. We also heard from family uh, community members that um, yeah, even going to all the funerals and honoring all the dead, there's a, a um, sometimes we have to help community members with the responsibility and having to navigate, can they handle going to all the memorial services or support all the community uh, organizations that are created by family members of the bereaved and helping that, um, helping with those responsibilities as well. So when thinking about um, bereavement and grief, it's really important to share with folks, there's no set timetable. Just because the one year anniversary is coming up and we think that there's that one, one year timeline, we each have our own timeline and everyone, even in one's family will have different um, timelines. That grief can affect our work, our home, our school life, um, different parts of our lives and how do we make sure that we navigate each of these impacts. Um, and no two, children, no two individuals will grieve in the same way. And that those that have had pre-existing either traumas or pre-existing challenges could impact uh, more so how, how you're doing with the current event. Mm -hmm. So many times I get asked by how can caregivers help um, those um, kids who are grieving? Well, there are great tools and resources out there. Sometimes using children's books helps tremendously. It helps to start that conversation. We also know that um, finding ways to honor the death of, uh, uh, finding ways to honor that loved one who died, making sure that we open up that communication with kids and, um, validate their feelings, address the new fears that might be coming up. They might be worried about the safety of other family members or uh, worried about the uh, future because of financial constraints. How do we make sure that we help with that? As I've been highlighting, um, there's no one uh, coping strategy that works in all situations. So we really want to think about how do we um, make sure that uh, caregivers and kids have an, a menu of effective coping strategies and thinking through when and how to use them. 
um, increasing those comforting connections and thinking about those support, um, whether it's additional teachers or faith-based members or mental health, who are those connections that are helping that family right now and making sure that there is enough to really help them get th through these difficult times. Um, really making sure that we highlight um, the surviving, um, uh, the caregiver role and that so many times when I'm working with uh, caregivers or parents, um, I get the question, should I be disciplining my kid because of what they experienced? And um, kids do best with a predictable environment. Routines are good. And yes, they do need to know that there's a limit to their behaviors. And so um, effective disciplining is, is important even in these times. And sometimes we need to reinforce that. We also have to be good communicators, willing to have the conversation with our kids multiple times, checking in with them on how they're doing. And many times I talk to families about, let's not have those conversations right before bedtime, um, because red bedtime is the time to start relaxing our bodies, not having that difficult conversation of sadness and grief. So is there other times in, um, in the day to do those check-ins? And making sure that the child is able to be um, the focus of the, the morning process and not, um, not to have it the, the caregiver dictate the timeline. Depending on um, how, a, um, when there has been a uh, unexpected death that we know that that can actually create um, traumatic grief. And what I mean by traumatic grief is that mourning and bereavement and thinking about our loved ones is normal. But sometimes when there has been a, a killing of a loved one, the suddenness of it, we could be thinking about how the, the person died, which prevents us from um, reminiscing. It prevents us from things that remind us of how they died. And so we, as the Child Trauma Network, has a series of fact sheets, including when there have been a, a death uh, because of active duty. So for our military parents and caregivers, for our school staff, um, our mental health providers, youth themselves, You'll see at the bottom our website, nctsn.org, and you just the traumatic grief resources are all um, here that uh, you can take a look at, and they're available in multiple languages. But we also need to make sure that our mental health providers are trained in both grief and um, prolonged grief interventions, that um, we do have strat uh, resources that we can give to caregivers to help empower them. One of them um, that we have is um, uh, uh, Power of Parenting. Uh, this one is on COVID-19, but we have ones that also are for mourning the, the death of, a, of a, a parent and making sure that we acknowledge and support surviving siblings when they also have experienced a, a death. So, kind of thinking through um, how we can provide support, um, I think of kind of my five main areas of intervention. So mass violent events make us fearful um, of our safety. And so safety interventions is one major piece. So we do need to think about what are the safety concerns and are there additional adversities because of this event? Uh, we need to communicate what's being done in our community or in the school to help address those safety issues, um, to help with recovery, um, making sure that um, the media are conveying these safety messages um, and not just about the imminent threat. Um, and we put in um, educating others about limiting news exposure um, in media literacy and social media um, safety as well, because we have seen that media in social media can help increase our social support. It can help create, give us comfort, but there also can be some negative in this. And so 
um, one of the things that that we heard saw in my research is that some people will stay up all night watching the news or being on social media um, and that they get overly excessively consumed with the media. When that happens, we know that their uh, distress levels increase and that their functioning, whether it's sleep or interpersonal relationships can change. So sometimes we have to help to put a limit on that. Some people are seeing the social, uh, watching this media because they're trying to search for answers. So sometimes having others help them get those answers for them so that they don't have to be overly lo looking at this can help. Sometimes um, letting them know that um, putting a timer or a limiting how much they're consuming is important. And having a conversation with our kids in particular, what are they seeing and how are they reacting to that? One of the things that um, has been one of the most challenging responding to these kind of events is that um, there are always people that are gonna take advantage of this stressed community. And so there are many out there that will uh, say that these events didn't happen, that uh, will question um, those that were um, uh, that might be bereaved or um, said that they were in life threat. Um, some might give messaging um, that's jarring to us, promoting a, a perpetrator for their actions. And so we need to help um, help those that were impacted in this so that they can um, navigate these challenging um, media um, circumstances. We also know, and I said before, that there's a lot more hate crimes and hate crimes, whether it's um, against the LGBTQ community, um, our Asian, Black, Hispanic, um, anti-Semitic, um, Islamophobia, all of these hate crimes are increasing. And so it's important for us to, when an event has targeted a certain identity, that we need to um, really pay a special attention on helping out in these community, uh, these situations. And we do have a couple of resources uh, to help uh, caregivers with these hate crimes and needing to think about how do we first and foremost as adults pay attention to our own reactions. Sometimes we have to have discussions um, ourselves with our support systems before we can have our conversations with the kids about what it meant that our identity was actually the target of this situation. Um, listening to how um, our kids are reacting. Um, are they worried about safety for themselves or in, um, has there been similar types of hate or bullying at school or in their own community that they are worried about? Um, are there increased uh, safety protocols being in place, for example, after um, some anti-Semitic um, events, there has been increased security uh, at uh, uh, synagogues and helping kids to understand why that is happening. So we need to have those conversations, but we also need to think about, is there any teachable moments of um, what our family values are and what is important to our family. Um, the pride we have in our culture and our traditions and why those are important to us are all things that could actually help um, that family unit stick together. So we talked about safety and calming are, is the second category. We know that mass violence interrupts us, causes lots of distress, as I talked about before. So we really need to be thinking about supporting the bereaved, talking about those trauma and loss reminders, helping with overall reactions, what are types of techniques we can be doing, and making sure it is clear, if I need extra help, where do I get those that help? Um, and I do want to make sure that just um, especially in the early days, sometimes people are saying so many people are in distress. 
um, doesn't that mean that they're going to have um, psychopathology or long-term consequences? And I want to make sure that we are clear in the first several weeks after an event like this, there is going to be distress. It is appropriate. But that does not mean that all those that are in distress are going to have psychopathology. We want to help with that distress. Um, things like psychological first aid, which I will highlight in just a few minutes, will help with that. But and also increasing one's social supports in this time, as well as uh, the coping strategies can make, make a major difference. So when we're talking about um, helping youth after mass violence, we have a great resource that talks about helping kids uh, with their feelings of being afraid or um, if they do feel unsafe, helping them get back to routines because it just doesn't happen instantly. Making sure we understand what their reactions are and also give a little bit of break. Sometimes when youth have been through these types of incidences, even just everyday challenges can feel worse. And then kids start worrying can they not function anymore? So making sure we give some ease to that, that we give some space and time to address how their identities might have been impacted. And really sometimes, especially our teens or young adults will really want to search for meaning and maybe actually participate in pro-social um, events or advocacy. For our younger kids, there's some great tools. Um, if any of you have seen, colleagues of mine wrote a book called Once I Was Very, Very Scared. It's in multiple languages. Um, there is PDF versions at pipploproductions.com, which are free. Um, if you wanted a hard copy, those are there is a, a charge for that. But there is um, video uh, YouTube productions, and it talks about when I've been through different types of traumas, including when a loved one um, was killed. Sesame Street has some great resources on grief, on um, violence, and also for military families. They have a website and they have some um, mobile apps that might be helpful to help to navigate young kids with their coping strategies. So let me keep moving forward here. So we talked about um, uh, safety, we talked about calming, self-efficacy. So self-efficacy is really tapping into making sure that we acknowledge um, the strengths of those that we're serving, the strengths of those community, uh, those in the community. As much as possible, we want all stakeholders involved in decision-making and whether it's having town hall, um, uh, thinks and thinking about ways to have days of service or days of uh, kindness can really be helpful. Um, many have ta um, talked about um, why did Sandy Hook actually uh, create a new building? And one of the things that um, there was such a long process about what, what was the best uh, decision, but we actually had focus groups of those that were impacted and even building of the new building the architect that was hired, that part of their hiring process of the architect that they were used, they actually had to do focus group with the families of the deceased, with the educators, with the first responders, with members of the community to talk about um, the look and feel and what this they wanted the school to represent. We could never take, um, we could never bring those that were lost that day back but we could make sure that the, whatever was put in place was more of a healing process. And that process in and of itself of having these painful conversations really was a healing, um, a healing opportunity for the community. So we also, the fourth category is connectedness. There's so much data on there that the stronger the social connector uh, connections we have, the more, um, uh, that mitigates long-term consequences. So we need to make sure that those social connections are of high quality, that they are um, supportive and not um, in reducing some of those negative social influences. 
We also need to appreciate that when we're talking about connectedness and talking about mass violence is that um, at one year anniversaries, people are always worried about another event happening. I worry about the increase of suicidality. So when we are thinking about uh, helping a community after these events, we need to make sure that there are suicide prevention protocols at, in the schools and in the communities. And we need to help kids with helping their um, have these conversations with their peers. So members of my network put together these peer cards. There's um, three um, talking about suicide or self-harm with our friends and peers. What are some of the myths? How do I provide this support? Um, there, uh, it's also, um, there's added discussions about what words to use, knowing the signs and, um, uh, and how to take care of myself after having one of these difficult moments. Uh, this resource, uh, is, uh, being, um, youth are loving it because it's really very, uh, clear and, um, easy to, to, um, um, the visuals are great for youth and it's English and in Spanish. And the last category that I wanted to highlight is hope. We always need to help people to um, throughout the recovery and healing process, um, know that there is a path, that path is different for every community. We need to know, help the youth know that their futures matter, that we care about them. Uh, we need to make sure that we spend time with the memorialization, making meaning and accepting that although their lives have have changed, there are things that they can still hold on to, that there is growth from this and that we need to support them as they create these this journey. So we think um, that creating school based recovery programs um, are es essential. And that um, because we know that, um, as I said before, that these events do impact um, kids' um, success in school, that we know there's higher rates of expulsion suspensions, that there can be increased rates of suicide and self-harm, that we see um, increased days of, of school absences and reductions of, high, um, of graduation. So really thinking about how do we make sure we support kids in schools, not just in their home area where it impacted, but also thinking about as they get to um, college or their next steps, making sure that they have a support there too, because some kids may not um, realize that they need that support while they are in um, at their home school and might not realize to afterwards. Um, this uh, young senior um, really highlighted that it wasn't till her sophomore year that she finally hit um, bottom and that she realized that she needed help. Um, but thinking about what are those things that we can help um, make sure that kids get the support that, that, that are needed. So we do think about mapping, as I said, thinking about those dose of exposure, make sure that there's training and education of our educators. We do have a great one pager of helping educators on what are some reactions kids will have and what are things that they can be doing to support them. Plus, there are evidence-based practices that we can be chaining our, our mental health providers in the school systems as well as in the community. Thinking about partnerships with our families, with other uh, institutions and communities to help with the overall supports and that the supports and services need to be for our students, our staff, and families. Um, we do need to think about how to adapt emergency um, and safety protocols, um, as well as thinking about how to handle all the extra um, issues that come up after mass violence, whether it's how to handle anniversaries, all the temporary memorial materials that are, and sometimes there are criminal investigations that we have to be dealing with and navigating. That academic support that I talked about, making sure that there are um, additional support staff in the school systems, whether those are uh, permanent substitutes, um, having additional professional development days so that our educators um, are cared for. Um, kids 
recover be better when the adults are doing well. So we do need to make sure that our educators are, are getting those kind of supports. Um, and thinking about those times of transitions and with the new academic year, helping kids, um, if they've been through something, um, going a, a day or two early and going just into the school building again and getting acquainted to the rituals and routines can really help make a difference. There are different evidence-based treatments that are out there and available. The, if you go on our website, the nctsn.org, we do have under trauma treatments a uh, listing of each of these uh, interventions, what are their evidence based and who are they used for. And we do need to make sure that we have broad based uh, um, interventions for all in the community. For those with moderate intervention, uh, moderate um, impact, there are group interventions like cognitive behavioral interventions for school trauma in schools, um, or bounce back, which is the earlier version. That's the K through fourth grade version of CBITS. And there are community-based um, interventions. Many of you might know trauma-focused uh, CBT or trauma grief component therapy. So psychological first aid um, is one that I had an influence in, and this is an early intervention. Um, we have it for school systems, for faith-based. We have it translated into different lang languages. I can't get into all the details now, but if you're wanting to learn more about psychological first aid, we actually have a free e-learning course on learn.nctsn.org. And you can get free CE credits, but it really does tap into thinking about how do we make effective engagement with our youth and educators who have been impacted by a trauma, those safety issues, thinking about ways we can stabilize a system or an individual, making sure we gather that information so that we know what types of supports what basic needs, if they need social supports, that coping strategies that we um, talked about, and thinking about is there other referrals or linkages to services that could help them during this time. S Skills for Psychological Recovery is really um, another community-based intervention that can uh, be used for paraprofessionals. Um, it can be um, in community settings, our uh, Boys and Girls Club, um, even libraries, uh, community settings, um, our faith-based communities, our healthcare institutions. Uh, it's an in a skills building inter intervention that if I have one time with somebody, how do I make sure I make the most of that time? Again, you can learn about NCTSN. All of our manuals are on our website, as well as there's a free e-learning course right next to the PFA online. Um, again, you can get CEs and it highlights how do we, again, gather that information, but thinking about what types of skills are most needed after mass violence, helping with effective problem solve for all the adversities that they're experiencing, thinking about wellness and positive activities and making sure that people are okay with um, doing those things that create joy and laugh, helping with those distressing reactions we talked about, um, making sure that help, our social connections are staying healthy. And sometimes we do need to be tap, tapping into or are our thoughts keeping us negative and not helping us on our road to healing. Um, it's important that we think about what are those barriers that keep people from um, going into services. And we so mind, um, in our interviews, we heard so many individuals saying, I wasn't the one that was worst off. So others should, um, I didn't want to take a place of somebody who really needed it. We need to make sure that we um, have services for everyone who needs it. We need to increase our timetable. We heard from so many in so many different communities that um, seven, eight, 10 years later, people are still coming into the door for the first time asking for help and that we need to make sure that we have those supports available and that we make sure we actually um, explain 
why these uh, services are needed and help them to understand why they're having some of the reactions that they're having. Um, I just, uh, as I'm starting to wrap up, um, we know that preparedness is important and that um, we do need to have conversations with our kids if they are worried about some of the recent events, what they can do and what schools are doing for school emergency. So being aware of your emergence of school emergency plans, um, why school um, uh, active intruder drills are important. Not all drills are the same. And you can see on our website that we've really um, decide, um, talk through that drills should be announced, that we should make sure that we help kids beforehand who might have had trauma histories to get support on how to cope with them or even just navigating. And we do not, um, when I'm talking about a drill, I'm not talking about an active simulation where police presence are involved. We don't need to um, create additional traumas to our kids, but we do need to them to know if there is an emergency that there are um, actions they can do to keep them safe. So as we end, I just um, want us to take for a moment that uh, we created this new uh, self-care resource called PRN. So as we think about self-care and PRN for our wellness to promote our own wellness, I want us to think about and take three breaths right now. One breath in is take a, a breath on how is our bodies feeling right now? Where are we holding our attention? The second breath, what's happening in our minds? Is it feeling cluttered? Um, and that third, is it full of worries? And that third breath is naming and noticing our intense feelings. Reset is how do we, between meetings, going from this training to maybe seeing a client or attending to our kids, how do we make sure that we feel steady, that we're more confident, that we can focus? What are those actions that we need to be doing? It could be uh, spending a moment and petting, um, petting an animal if we're home, uh, going outside and taking a breath, having a cup of coffee, sharing gratitude to a colleague, um, talking to a friend, and that nourishes really thinking about um, how do we make sure that we replenish and nourish ourselves. So making sure that we have meaningful moments, that we find playfulness, heart, um, lightheartedness, joy, um, that we celebrate our successes, um, and that uh, we take care of ourselves in this. There, um, and I'll make sure that these um, these. Um, PowerPoints are available to you, but the um, or the resources I'm talking about, there are some great apps out there that many of you uh, might be interested in. Uh, Headspace Liberate Meditation. The National Ma uh, Mass Violence Victimization Resource ha Center has an app called Transcend. It is for survivors of mass violence, and they also have a website that is available, um, that has a lot of great resources for victims of crime, for survivors, for mental health providers. Other resources, um, we should all be aware of um, the crime victim boards and what is available in our states. Each state has different. Um, so going to your crime victims compensation boards and getting familiarized with what's available in your state for those who have been a victim of a um, of a crime, Victim Connect actually helps us to identify what our rights are. If I'm just needing support after any of these events, Disaster Distress Helpline is always available. Some of us just want to sometimes donate after big events. Sometimes. Um, uh, fraudulent uh, funds are created after these big events. The National Compassion Fund is trying to prevent that, and they are made up of board members who are family members who have been through other mass violent events. And then we have um, Voices of uh, Voices Center for Resilience, which uh, was created after 9/11, and they have wonderful resources as well. So, if you're wanting um, 
nctsn.org, learn, um, or if you're just wanting any of our info, go to um, just type in info at nctsn and sign up for um, any of our updates. I'm sorry I went a minute or so over, but I, um, I'm happy also to stay on if there are any questions. So thanks everybody for your time today. And thank you, Dr. Brimer. That was fantastic. We really appreciate your time. Um, we are over time, but but as Dr. Brimer said, if anyone wants to ask a question, feel free uh, in the next minute or so. Um, but again, thank you very much. We have the recording. We will share it both inside and outside of the network and get, get more out of this uh, going forward for sure. And I'm happy to send a resource list. And if you want to put that on your um, on your uh, next to the presentation, you guys can just give me a half day to uh, put them all in one place and then you can have those and everyone, I'll make sure all the links for all those resources are available. That sounds perfect. Thank you so much. That's That'll be great. All right. Thanks everyone for joining. We'll see you next time. Thanks everyone. Don't all forget right. your PRN for wellness. <laughs>